wrongful convictions, it's an epidemic. It's not isolated to one race. Um, it affects poor people, it affects wealthy people, black, white. The criminal justice system doesn't work like it does on Law & Order or CSI. Or huge numbers of mistakes are being made every day. Not everybody who's behind bars belongs there. Innocent until proven guilty is a great ideal if we could actually live up to it. But the sad reality is that we don't. I spent 11 years in prison based on hearsay. Every day in prison is a bad day. Mark, Howard, and I have been friends since I think it was three or four years old. We grew up together from lovey-dovey preschool. And, you know, we continue to joke that, you know, uh, Mark went to Yale and I went to jail. Marty himself uh, was wrongfully convicted when we were seniors in high school. His parents were murdered. He was convicted of murdering his parents. And I'd always believed that he was innocent. And finally I got involved with his legal team and eventually it took him 17 and a half years, but we were able to prove his innocence. 6,338 days I was in prison before I was finally released on December 27th, 2007. So when Mark asked me to teach a class at Georgetown, in a weird way I thought it was crazy because it was kind of like out of the blue, we started talking about it and I go, are you serious? He goes, yeah. And what ends up happening? You end up in prison. And Marty coming down here and being a co-professor with me for this course and for the goal of trying to get other people, other Martys, if you will, out of prison was just tremendous and really exciting. I think America sees itself as such a gold standard in terms of human rights and justice and then you see these instances where the system has so incredibly failed someone. I absolutely believe in John Moss's innocence. It's so just obvious that he didn't do it. How anybody ever got a conviction out of this, I, I have no idea. It's a textbook example of a, a coerced confession or a false confession case. They didn't even find the murder weapon. They didn't, there was nothing that really linked, like forensically linked Kenneth to the crime the night of the murder. There's a door on the back of the house. They found blood pooling in the front bedroom and then supposedly dragged her to the back bedroom diagonal across the house. So this is probably it. So the shooter was coming from East Cold Spring Lane that way, tried to rob Terrence McCoy over here, and there's the guardrail. A couple of weeks before Justin Baumgartner was murdered, he filed a police report saying that a green Ford I tried to run him off the road. John confessed. He was repeatedly punched by Trooper Smith, is what he said, and basically were like, if you don't say you did this, if you don't confess, this is where they'll find your body. When they accused me of this, like, it hit me so hard, right? It, it just killed me, you know, and I figured that it would all work itself out. When they gave me 39 years or whatever he gave me, I was just, I, I think I was in space. Well, two things both of you keep saying is there's no physical evidence. What physical evidence should there have been? This is a shooting on there the street. Was, um, Valentino's clothes were taken into evidence and his hands were tested for gunshot residue and then none of that evidence was presented in court. What was your perception of Monfried, his defense lawyer, at the time of the trial? He was, um, you know, a seasoned, mm -hmm. you know, well thought of attorney. He actually fell asleep during the trial. A lot of attorneys listen with their eyes closed. These are lawyers who, you know, take oaths to, to uphold their, their uh, oaths to their profession, and they cheat, steal, hide evidence. They are never going to budge on his, on his being guilty, and we're just students. So it's going to be hard to convince all of these people that we're right and they're wrong. Would you happen to know where, um, or who the people who live in apartment B are? I was never 100% sure that 
Kenneth Bond was the person that I saw that evening. His life should not have been taken away from him based on the testimony that I provided. This isn't just a class. This isn't just about wrongful convictions. This is about people's lives. The Holy Grail for us would obviously be one of our five cases, one of the five people we believe were wrongfully convicted, getting out, getting exonerated, and coming home. have done the calculations and have found that you are eligible for release today. It was extremely emotional hearing his family cheering, clapping. I just felt Overwhelmed. I just felt so happy for him and hopeful that this experience could happen again with his class and with other people who have been wrongfully convicted. The students gave me the most hope that I've ever felt in 27 years. When the students got on board, it was like, this is going to happen. The minute I mentioned Georgetown, they said, oh, you're going home. Nobody had any doubt. You know, nobody had any reservations. Honestly, for this to happen is an out-of-this-world experience for me. It seems almost miraculous in this.